Uh, Shawan had asked me to try to provide uh, a little bit about CyberJS progress and perspectives uh, from the perspective of uh, USGS. Um, first of all, let me try to place where we are in USGS. USGS is a fairly large organization. We're a small research group. Uh, but our research focus is specifically geospatial information. Uh, CEGIS, the Center of Excellence for Geospatial Information and Science, uh, was formed in 2006 uh, specifically to address problems uh, of the national map uh, and to try to conduct fundamental research that would lead to future capabilities within the national map. In doing so, we have a strong um, tie uh, to the production organization uh, in terms of the results of our research feed directly into uh, production activities uh, in, in future uh, dates. What I'm going to do in this talk uh, is provide a little bit, I'll, I'll have one slide to talk about the progress because I think Mike Nim went into some detail on that in, in the uh, technical sessions that we had, uh, but I'll just highlight some bullets from that. But what I want to do mostly in this presentation is provide you some context of future things that are going to be happening at USGS with respect to data uh, that I think lend themselves to cyber GIS. Uh, and then uh, I'll end with some of the kinds of problems uh, that I think we face uh, that cyber GIS is an appropriate tool. So a little bit of an outline. Uh, first of all, the, uh, why are we in looking at cyber GIS? A little bit about the needs. Uh, our focus, as I said, is the national map, and I'll show just a little bit of that. Uh, and I'll apologize to those of you. Some of you have seen some of the slides about this in terms of background, so I won't spend much time there. But for those of you who haven't, uh, I, I think it might be instructional for you to see uh, essentially what the national map is uh, and where we're trying to go with it. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about our progress to date in cyber GIS. The main part of what I'm going to do is focus on the perspective for the future uh, of cyber GIS at USGS. And there are several projects I'll talk about. Uh, one known as 3DEP, uh, that's just uh, essentially getting started. Uh, also, uh, there's a major push now in Alaska uh, to do mapping of Alaska. Uh, and so that has some uh, large problems that I think lend themselves to this kind of environment. Uh, we're also uh, hoping in the future to move to something uh, that we call maps or analysis on demand. Rather than providing a standard seven and a half minute quadrangle basis for a map, we want the user to be able to select their own. Uh, and that has some problems for us in terms of a, a production line flow uh, and how we deal with that. And then, as I said, I'll end with some problems and draw a couple of conclusions. So our needs uh, for cyber GIS are really driven by the fact that we have multiple nationwide data sets at very high resolution. Uh, many of the calculations that, uh, are, that we use in uh, our processing of uh, these data sets are, are very complex. Uh, and we also have to integrate the data sets in order to produce a comprehensive product. And then finally, we are moving in a direction of creating a resource description framework, uh, RDF, uh, files uh, as a base for semantics uh, from our legacy USGS databases, uh, which are in primarily geodatabase and, and image types of formats. Um, and the conversion of those things uh, is a very uh, comprehensive uh, in terms of computational intensity. So what's our current state? Well, our current state is that uh, we have a layer-based approach uh, to all of our data. Uh, we are in the process of generating new topographic maps every three years for the entire United States. Uh, that requires us to produce 18,000 maps per year. Uh, we're producing over 100 maps a day. Put this in context of topographic mapping, it took us 50 years to get the first once-over coverage of the United States with the 55,000 seven and a half minute quadrangles that it takes to cover it. Now we're doing it uh, repetitively every three years. Um, we also provide viewer access with display, <coughs> download, and mashups with other data uh, through things like uh, KML, uh, and that's through the National Map Viewer. So there are some problems with this. Uh, the rapid display and delivery uh, relies on uh, tile cache schemes, uh, and we have some work going on. Mike's leading the effort on that. Uh, on uh, tile caching. Uh, right now, all of it uses single CPU technology, and, and we'd like to move some of this uh, to the parallel environment. I've used this slide a couple of times uh, previously. Uh, these are some data sets, and, and I originally pulled this slide together for the National Academy of Sciences, uh, which is conducting a study for the U.S. Geological Survey uh, entitled uh, 
especially in enabling uh, uh, USGS strategic science in the 21st century. Uh, my understanding is that report is done. We're waiting on final delivery uh, right now. But this set of uh, data was pulled, our uh, table was pulled together just to show them some of the kinds of data, and it's by no means comprehensive, that we have that are nationwide. Uh, spend a little bit of time here because what's happening with this table now is it's actually being taken and placed on the USGS website so that you can go to one site at USGS and you can access all of these different data sets and then we're adding, it's going to be added, uh, there are going to be many sets added to it that I didn't include in my original survey. <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, the top uh, eight items are layers of the national map. Uh, many of you are familiar with those. Uh, the ones that are in green are essentially uh, information that is supported, supports the science programs of USGS through the geological applications, the biological applications, and the water resources applications. Um, there is certainly is a need to bring all of these things together in an integrated uh, environment. So the national map layers, land cover, structures, uh, boundaries, hydrography, geographic names, transportation, elevation, and ortho-imagery. USGS main, uh, works with all of these uh, data sets to produce the national map. Um, this is an actual uh, cutout of uh, an, an area in Missouri that shows real data uh, for each one of those layers. The, um, <coughs> um, so one of the problems that we have uh, with maintaining uh, the data sets in the national map is that the USGS does not have uh, responsibility uh, for all of those layers. Uh, the federal government uh, has uh, provided, uh, through the A-16 legislation, a specific agency that's responsible for different uh, geospatial data layers. Of the ones here, uh, the USGS is responsible for land cover, hydrography, geographic names, elevation, and orthoimagery. The others fall to other agencies, and we rely on those other agencies to provide us current and, and uh, data that we can actually incorporate into the national map. So that's something of a problem for us, and, and I'll, I'll come back to that when I talk about Alaska in a little bit. Well, the eight layers, what do we actually have? All of these are available. Uh, they're all public domain. Everything that we do is public domain. Um, but we have, as I said before, multiple repetitive coverages. For land cover, we have a uh, 30 meter resolution for the entire country at three different dates, uh, 92, 2000, and 2006. And then the 2011 data is in work right now. For the national elevation data set, uh, we have uh, one arc second, one third, and one ninth arc second uh, data sets that are available. The one and one third are nationwide. The one ninth, <coughs> excuse me, the one ninth arc second uh, is. Um, is in work, and I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on elevation here in just a moment. Uh, our ortho data sets are multiple dates, multiple resolutions, uh, all the way down to a third of a meter in urban areas, 133 major urban areas. Uh, there's repetitive coverages of those, uh, and those are very large data sets. Uh, we, we su support all of the geographic names uh, for the United States through uh, the Board on Geographic Names. Um, but we maintain uh, essentially a gazetteer uh, in the geographic names information system. And then uh, the last three sets of the set are maintained by other organizations. Uh, we rely on them to provide us sources of information for our, our mapping programs and for our geospatial databases. So, progress to date. What have we done in cyber GIS? Well, in uh, the uh, collaboration uh, uh, with this project, uh, we've been focusing primarily on complex computations for map projections. Uh, map projections, uh, essentially, uh, a lot of people think all the problems are solved, uh, but there are some real problems in map projections today. Uh, some of them are, are being perpetuated by uh, some of the organizations like Google uh, with the Web, Web Mercator projection, which has some advantages for what it's used for and has some disadvantages uh, that we really should address. So one of the ways to deal with map projections for large uh, data sets uh, with the complex calculations is through CyberGIS. So where we are is this program that uh, Mike and I have been working on called uh, PRaster Blaster that uh, has been, uh, was an original program developed in the 90s in uh, the USGS. Uh, for primarily for tr uh, doing map projections with raster data. 
uh, and we've taken that uh, and adapted it for the CyberGIS environment. Uh, so these are the kind of the bullets of, of, of that activity. Uh, version 1 was released the 1st of April this year. Uh, there were some substantive I.O. bottlenecks, uh, and those are being addressed. Uh, version 1.5 uh, will be out soon to fix the identified bottlenecks and use a parallel uh, input-output library. Uh, we're going through iterative testing. Uh, and then we're adopting some of the uh, things that have been developed for this project into a desktop version uh, of uh, Raster Blaster called D Raster Blaster. There's a library of core functions that are shared by uh, the two implementations uh, of the software, and it's almost complete. One other thing that we've done, and I mentioned this yesterday in the afternoon session that we had, uh, we have provided the national elevation data set a 10 meter resolution for the entire country uh, to uh, the group here, and they have made it available through the CyberGIS uh, gateway. Uh, those of you that uh, looked at the V-SHED analysis that we did, you were using uh, these data uh, to do that V-SHED analysis. So what's the perspective for the future of CyberGIS at USGS? I'm going to talk about elevation, as I said earlier. Uh, the USGS, uh, along with a, a number of other agencies, just recently completed uh, the, a study known as the National Enhanced Elevation Assessment. Uh, the website that I have there contains the final report and other information uh, about the assessment. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the results and kind of where it's pointing us to. Uh, the results indicate that uh, national level enhanced elevation data could provide a potential benefit anywhere from $1.2 billion to $13 billion per year, uh, according to the agencies that were surveyed and their utility of these kinds of data. Uh, the review and feedback uh, of the proposed 3 dep program uh, essentially uh, came up with a recommendation for what's known as quality level two data on an eight-year cycle for high resolution elevation for the country. So quality level two is the green line on this. Uh, the NEA study uh, addressed five different quality levels because not everybody needs the highest resolution elevation data. Some can get by with lower resolutions. And the study was very comprehensive. Um, and I encourage you to take a look at that study. It's about 100 pages, uh, but it's very comprehensive in terms of looking at all the aspects of how elevation would be used. Uh, what the study determined was that if we acquire quality level two data from LIDAR, uh, at a point density of two points per meter squared, which gives you, uh, and with a nominal pulse rate uh, of 0.7 uh, per meter, and a DEM post spacing of, uh, of 1 27th of an arc second, which is approximately two meters. Uh, vertical accuracy uh, about 9.25 uh, centimeters. Uh, we could actually meet uh, most of the requirements of all of the federal agencies uh, that use um, elevation data. And those requirements, as I say, if we did that, would generate the benefits that I talked about earlier of about $1.2 uh, billion to $13 billion per year. So that's what quality level two means and how it fits into the study. The other quality levels are here. Some of them, uh, actually, as I said, some places could get by with quality level four. Some, some organizations wanted quality level one for everything. But the study shows that if we acquired quality level one for, for all of the United States, for all of our requirements, then we would, it would cost more to acquire those kinds of data and the benefits would not be uh, what we, we had projected from quality level two. So the current status of the nation's elevation data, uh, these are results of an inventory that was done through the NIA. Um, this map depicts the public sources. All of these are uh, public domain. Uh, so you can go to these locations and, uh, or to our sites and you can download uh, data for the areas that are here in Yala. Notice that uh, most of the data that are available now are quality level three or quality level four. So the quality level two data, uh, really there's not much of it out there, or quality level one. There are some in the Pacific Northwest. There are a number of places where they've required quality level one data. Um, so uh, the other, if you read the text over on the right-hand side, uh, from 1996 to 2011, where LIDAR has been uh, collected, uh, we now have about 28% coverage with LIDAR for the 49 states, about 15% coverage uh, in Alaska. Uh, it, but it's on a 30-year replacement cycle. 
Uh, it's well coordinated. There's less than 10% overlap in any of the coverages that have been acquired, but the data quality is variable. So why is it a problem? Well, the remaining 72% of the coverage is 30 or more years old. Alaska has very poor quality. Uh, the data that are available only meet 10% uh, meet of the uh, reported needs for elevation data. The current and emerging needs really require higher uh, quality data. These are uh, maps that show the publicly available point cloud data uh, through the USGS resources. Um, and again, it's, this, it, it's mostly the same map. Uh, it, not all cases do they provide point clouds. Some cases only provide uh, the uh, elevation data itself. Um, in the um, program that we're proposing, uh, we will acquire point cloud elevation, and uh, I'm really pushing to include the intensity information of the LIDAR signals as part of the data sets that would be available. So 3DEP. 3DEP is the proposed program that has come out of the NEA study. Uh, we're trying to get support now from multiple federal agent and state agencies to actually produce the nationwide coverage of 3DEP. Uh, we want to communicate that that program is more than bare earth elevation. It's point cloud and other basic derivatives. What all of the derivatives are is really yet to be determined, but all of them would be distributed and archived. Uh, 3DEP essentially gives a perspective to see more than just what's on the surface. So that's why it uh, has the ability to meet a lot of the requirements uh, and generate the return on investment. Uh, if you want to, one of the things that has come out of this, after the NEA study and, and the inventories were done for the study, uh, there was a joint project put together by USGS, NOAA, and FEMA to make all of this inventory information available and to keep a, an ongoing inventory of elevation data that, uh, that the public could get to. And it's at this website if you, if you want to take a look at that. Okay, um, I'm talking about data, but uh, the point of all this is that we have all of the data that really requires uh, computational capability to handle it. So let me turn to a second problem that we have, and that's Alaska mapping. There's a major push now to map Alaska at 1 to 24,000 or 1 to 25,000 scale. It's going to be done uh, essentially using uh, resources that we have not used for mapping before. Uh, the image base will be statewide spot images at a two and a half meter resolution. Those are being acquired under a project uh, that the state of Alaska has uh, started. Um, they're also acquiring IFSAR data at a five meter post spacing. So those two are two basic layers you have to have uh, to uh, uh, perform a mapping operation. The National Geospatial Program, which CGIS is a part of, um, it begins map production in, uh, for Alaska in FY13, October 1st of this year. Uh, begins the new fiscal year for the federal government and we will start mapping Alaska. We only have 400 maps planned for Alaska uh, in uh, FY13. Now, put that in perspective, it takes about tw between 12 and 13,000 of these maps to cover the state of Alaska. Alaska is a big place. Uh, 55,000 for the lower 48, 12 to 13,000 just for the state of Alaska. Uh, we are limited to producing maps uh, where the spot data and the IFSAR data are available. So some of the problems that we have, in addition to the IFSAR and, and the uh, spot data, we also have to have hydrography. Well, there's no good source of hydrography data for Alaska. Uh, the current national hydrography data set that the USGS produced is from the 1 to 63,360 uh, scale and cannot be used for higher resolution mapping. Uh, we can generate hydrography from IFSAR, and we can match it to the images. But as you might suspect, <coughs> given <coughs> excuse me, the size of the, uh, the data volume and the complexity of, of the process to do that, this sounds like a problem for CyberGIS. Transportation, there's no current source uh, for Alaska. There is some availability from the Census Bureau. Uh, unfortunately, the Census Bureau only maps roads where there are houses because they are counting people. So you, you don't get uh, all the other roads that do not lead uh, to some kind of residence. Uh, there's some availability uh, through uh, volunteer geographic information through OpenStreetMap. Uh, again, that's primarily limited to the urban areas of Anchorage and Fairbanks, uh, and maybe some others. And uh, we are now, in our map production processes, working with commercial contract. 
so that's a possibility for Alaska as well for the map production. Geographic names, uh, we have to, in Alaska, uh, we deal with standard names, but we also have to deal with all the variant names that are there, the Native American uh, names that are up there. Uh, uh, and in some places there are as many as 75 variants for a single name. So we have to decide which ones we're going to include and not include. So it's, it's, that's a major problem for us. Uh, boundaries, there's multiple conflicting sources uh, boundaries. And in land cover, we have from the National Land Cover data set. So that was, that's Alaska, kind of what we're doing, uh, and uh, some of the problems we, ha we uh, face with that. Uh, the other thing that's coming in the future for the USGS is, uh, rather than creating maps on a quadrangle basis, we're going to do maps on demand, so that you can actually specify uh, an arbitrary uh, area. You could use a, 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 a geographic name, say a county, uh, and you could get a, all of the, you get the map produced for that county. Or you could specify an arbitrary polygon, provide a shape file or some other source, uh, and then we would uh, cut out and produce a map for that particular area. So maps on demand. It's a major shift uh, to real-time processing of requested areas from the kind of workflow that we have now uh, in which we produce 100 maps a day because they're a standard 7.5 minute product. We crank them through an automated process uh, using GIS software. Uh, and if anything interrupts that production line, things come to a stop, we don't get our 100 maps a day, we don't get the 18,000 a year, we miss our three-year cycle. So if you do maps on demand, it's a much different kind of process and requires different kinds of software and environment. Okay, let me turn now to some example problems that I think some of the background I gave you leads to uh, for CyberGIS, that we might use CyberGIS to, uh, to uh, handle. Well, the hydrography from IFSAR uh, and from 3 uh, If we get high resolution uh, elevation data uh, the LIDAR, from LIDAR, we can use those data to generate um, the hydrography. Well, we've, we've done some of that because as you saw, there's about 20% of the nation covered with LIDAR high resolution data now, although it's a little bit lower uh, quality than we would like. But we've done some of that testing, and what we find out is our current national hydrography data set doesn't match that. So there's a matching problem that has to happen. If you fill in the gaps in our current data with higher resolution, uh, so you actually would get a, a lot better quality data. But it's a very major problem to generate this for, you know, for the entire nation. So that's one, one kind of problem. The second kind of problem is uh, we need to identify all of the geomorphic features for the entire United States. They're shown simply by names on most of our topographic maps, but these are real features that people understand, hills and mountains and valleys and canyons and all those kinds of things. How do we represent them? How do we extract them? Well, one possibility, one possible approach is to use our, the national elevation data set or 3 depth data when it becomes available, use that along with images, and try to extract all of the features from that. A possible approach, we've been working with ontology design patterns. Uh, we could also use geomorphic and spectral signatures and use some kind of classifier like neural nets or perhaps some uh, object-based classifier to pull some of this out. Again, it's a very major problem to do this if you're going to try to do it for the whole country. Um, we've already established that we can use cyber GIS for pre-processing for our generalization algorithms for hydrography and for transportation. We spent the last five years doing an extensive development of generalization for uh, hydrography data. Uh, and the pre-processing for that, because it turns out that it, it is site-specific, that you use a different algorithm depending on the terrain characteristics, the moisture characteristics in that particular area. It's one of the things that the science has shown. Well, in order to do all the pre-processing, it's a very exhaustive uh, computational uh, task, and it lends itself to uh, cyber GIS. Some other problems uh, that lend themselves to cyber GIS, data conversion and delivery. We have, uh, we'd like to do uh, conversion of our legacy geospatial databases to RDF. Now, we are in our research in CGIS, we are converting nine research test areas that, that are uh, they're across, spread across the country. Uh, six of them are watersheds and different uh, hydrography terrain regimes. Um, and three of them are urban areas, St. Louis, Atlanta, and uh, New Haven, Connecticut, to provide us some variety in uh, the urban environment as well. CGIS is going to convert those and make those available in RDF. 
and then uh, people can download them from our website or can query our uh, endpoint uh, with uh, semantic technology to actually be able to access the data. Should we decide to convert the entire data sets that we have, then the conversion process definitely would require something like CyberGIS. Uh, the conversion uh, to RDF uh, is uh, very uh, intensive, takes a long time, and just in the sample data that we've converted, we've established that this is a problem for parallel computing. So the, the, third, the next item is the feature ident identification and conversion from raster data sets. I mentioned uh, the geomorphic features um, and again, the combination of Im elevation imagery land cover uh, and other information that we would put together would, would be a, an approach uh, that might possibly allow us to do that. I also mentioned tile caching for the viewer, which uh, is a problem that we have. We are in the process of moving all of our data to the cloud. Uh, so in the future, when you access and download USGS data, it won't be coming from a USGS server, it'll be coming from the cloud. Um, how do we handle the problem of tile caching? Uh, and we're not happy with some of the tile caching schemes that are out there now. And again, uh, Mike and his team uh, are looking at some of the tile caching uh, po uh, problems and possibilities for using uh, CyberGIS uh, to work with that. I'm going to turn last to some science applications uh, and um, talk just in general terms. I won't give you very specific problems, but some, some things that are going on. Uh, I'm, I mentioned extracting already um, the hydrography uh, from LiDAR and 3 depth, but we need to match the hydrography to find problems. We need to add streams that, that are found in extraction, not in the current. And the reason for all this is the National Hydrography data set is a major supporter of water modeling applications. And we are uh, continually trying to update and improve those data sets. And we certainly get complaints from the scientists doing the modeling that they're not adequate for the task that they have. So we think there's some potential there. Uh, data integration of the national map with other USGS nationwide data sets. Good examples are magnetic, gravity, and geologic data. Can we integrate all of those data sets with the national map? Again, if you do it on a nationwide basis, it's a lot of data to process. You want to provide that to the scientists so that they can uh, have that for their work. Similar integration with our uh, water and our biologic data sets is a similar kind of problem. Um, Integration for, uh, this is a, a project that we have just started. One of our scientists in CEGIS is working uh, on this, Tom Schoberg, uh, trying to integrate geospatial data and its derivatives with cultural transportation infrastructure and economic data to model urban uh, supply chains. And what happens in disasters if those supply chains break down? So we're trying to model that uh, and come up with solutions. And I think using all those kind of data, again, a problem for cyber GIS. So in conclusion, the USGS geospatial data map databases can really benefit uh, from CyberGIS for our production applications. There's a potential uh, for new science with CyberGIS using nationwide high resolution data sets processed as single units. And I come back to that idea, can we process the entire nation at one time and get information out that we couldn't get by processing things by individual seven half minute quadrangles or individual watersheds or the things that the science can benefit from by seeing or working with the whole thing in an analytical environment at one time. Those kinds of issues I think uh, need to be uh, investigated. So I'll conclude with that. Thank you. We have time for one question. Dan. Thank you. Um, I enjoyed that very much. So I was, uh, it was, I was pleased to see that you have these joint ventures with other agencies to move towards, uh, I guess, better, more common reference data sets and so forth. As you look forward and you, you talk about moving your data sets to the cloud, but then you also immediately use the word downloading. Do you, do you see any potential for uh, your organization or you in consortia with other federal agencies to actually provide services to the general public? Uh, so they, to envision doing computation over massive data sets at your data center that wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be possible to download and, and, and building up inventories of applications and app stores and so forth that kind of serve the public good. Uh, yes, I, that, that's something that, that we've discussed a number of times is the question of 
how, how far do we get into providing those kinds of services? Uh, if you look at our National Mount Viewer right now, it, you know there are certain things you can do with it, uh, but we don't try to replicate everything you could do in a desktop GIS with that. So the, the, there's a fine line of how much do we provide in terms of a service. Let's take elevation as an example. Uh, we could easily provide a service, uh, and we have already uh, available through some research that, we, that we've done, uh, and to be able to provide uh, derivatives of elevation such as slope and aspect, uh, and those kinds of things. Um, shaded relief is a standard product we already do, it, it, essentially a derivative of the elevation data. Actually putting those services on, our, uh, uh, making those services available where people could use them, uh, again, we, we have to be very careful of the federal government not to conflict with something that private industry can provide. But in answer to your question, yes, we could do that. The question is, where do we draw that line of what we provide so that we don't uh, step into a, an arena that private industry thinks that they really so own? There might be some new public-private Yes. And we've, we've done a lot of that in the past, uh, partnerships with private industry as well as other organizations. A good example is the uh, Terra server that we did with Microsoft for ortho images that allowed uh, those to become available. But we do those partnerships. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh